As Georgia uh, introduced, I have um, an interest, long-standing interest in um, antivirals, and my focus has always been on respiratory viruses. Um, I've mostly used influenza virus as my as my model, and I've you know built up probably more than a decade's work of, worth of experience working with this virus now. Um, and the projects I'm going to speak to you about today both um, are are looking at at influenza virus. Um, but of course, since uh, the um, emergence of SARS-CoV-2, our focus has now um, not totally switched, I would say, but grown to incorporate um, coronaviruses as well. So now my my lab is looking at both influenza virus and uh, coronaviruses. And on this slide, um, what I'm showing you is basically the similarities between these two virus families. So they show they share both um, structural similarities as well as uh, similarities in the diseases that they cause, uh, and also their um, their ability to um, potentially cause pandemics, which of course we've witnessed. So on the left hand side, you can see um, schematics of the virions for an influenza virus uh, versus SARS-CoV-2, and you can instantly see that um, they are both envelope viruses um, that are structurally um, quite similar. They both have RNA genomes, although influenza virus has a segmented um, negative strand um, RNA genome versus is the single um, uh, uh, segment of the um, positive strand uh, RNA virus genome for, for the coronaviruses. But they are, these uh, viruses are transmitted through the same mechanisms um, and obviously can cause a respiratory disease that can either be severe or, or mild, um, depending on, uh, on various factors. Importantly, and this is why I have it in red, is that both of these families um, uh, our, our viruses have animal reservoirs, and this is what gives them pandemic potential, um, because we have uh, viruses that are circulating in animals that can potentially um, be transmitted to humans if the, the animals and the humans come into the same um, um, shared space, and that can potentially give rise to a, a, a pandemic um, if that virus uh, learns how to transmit human to human. And so we are constantly aware of, of these viruses that are circulating. And although the flu, the flu world has been aware of this for you know, many, many, many years, hundred, you know, tens, hundreds of years, um, the coronavirus field, I think, has been awakened um, not so much that they were asleep, because, of course, we had SARS-CoV-1 and we have MERS coronavirus as well. But I think for sure um, we need to do more surveillance um, in the coronavirus world as well. So how do we protect against these um, emerging viruses? And I basically there are many ways, but I, I'm pointing out three um, today. First of all, surveillance. Um, and this has to be done both in the human and, and animal populations. And so obviously this, this just involves continually sampling. And nowadays um, sequencing, of course, has become a lot easier. Um, and so you can actually um, analyze the full genome sequences of the viruses that you're that um, you, you, that you are sampling. Um, and that, that could give you critical information as to um, the types of viruses that are circulating and, and the particular area um, that they're found in. And of course, if there's something uh, new that, that emerges, that would trigger an alert um, and um, we'd be on the, on the lookout for sustained uh, transmission. There are obviously a lot of dead end infections um, that, that occur uh, that never result in anything, but you're looking for the potential for transmission human to human. Then of course, biosecurity, which is not something that as virologists, we, um, we necessarily focus on, it's not, it's not our forte, but um, there should be um, an awareness that 
um, we should be limiting or in some case preventing the mixing of animals and humans who do, who do not normally come into contact with each other. And so this is why these live animal markets um, in Asia are such a concern, because there's animals coming in from all sorts of areas. Um, but they're very, the animals themselves are, are then put very close together. And of course, you've got then human interaction uh, as well. So that, that just creates the, the environment um, for potential um, for the potential of viruses to jump from uh, species to species. And then lastly, and this is the focus, of course, of, of my talk, is the need to develop broad acting antivirals. Um, we, we are all of us probably aware that we have broad spectrum antibiotics, um, but there's no such thing in the antiviral world. Um, right now, all our approved antiviral drugs are very specific um, for a certain virus, and therefore you first have to um, diagnose that virus before you know which antiviral drug to treat with. Um, and so if we if we had um, such broad spectrum antivirals, these would play a very important role in that period before a vaccine is developed. And if we you know just turn our minds back to um, you know the early days of 2020, where there was no vaccine yet. Um, and there were all these crazy hypotheses about you know hydrochloroquine and ivermectin being thrown around. Um, and with, with very little data. Um, and if we had at our disposal a, a verified antiviral that was known to have um, activity against, let's say, a coronavirus, that could have been um, um, uh, put onto the market um, in the interim before more specific drugs were developed um, and before the vaccine was developed. Also, the, of course, these can be stockpiled um, uh, uh, to to have it ready in in the case of an outbreak. So, in terms of of uh, SARS-CoV-2 um, for um, antivirals that we that we now have at our disposal for treating COVID, um, there are basically three um, virus specific compounds that have been approved. Um, the gold standard at the moment is uh, nematrelvir which targets the main protease of the virus. And uh, this is a, a given by the, the oral route, which is, which is the preferable um, route when you're, you're developing a drug. Um, and it's, it's given together with uh, ritonavir, which it basically just improves its bioavailability. So this goes under the brand name Paxlovid. Um, the other drugs that are available are malnupiravir, which targets the RNA polymerase of the virus. Um, I put a note here to say that it's it's not given to children, pregnant women, or breastfeeding women, and this is because this drug um, basically causes what's called error catastrophe. So that that's how it inhibits the virus. It, it um, allows the introduce, introduction of multiple errors while the uh, polymerase is, is copying. Um, there's some concern that the compound would also cause similar errors um, in DNA uh, replication, i.e. in the host genome. And so this is why this, this caution um, is given um, to, to in terms of who it is um, prescribed to. Um, so there's some concerns uh, about uh, this drug. And then uh, lastly, of course, remdesivir, which um, uh, also targets the RNA polymerase. This is given intravenously, though, so is more um, kept for hospitalized patients. So we don't we don't have a large panel of uh, virus specific drugs yet. Of course, there are more um, in in clinical development, but this is the the state of the field at the moment. And then my screen seems to have frozen. Oh, there we go. Um, then moving on to to influenza, of course, you know we have um, more many more years of of uh, research and experience with influenza. So we have a, a larger panel panel of drugs. However, not without their own problems. So in blue are the um, adamantanes. These two drugs, which were the first drugs approved for treating influenza, target the M two ion channel protein in the in the virus. However, they are 
completely useless at the moment because all circulating influenza viruses are resistant um, to these drugs. So effectively, they're, they're not on the shelf anymore. In green are the drugs that target the neuraminidase of influenza virus. And the absolute gold standard is definitely oseltamivir, which is given through the oral route. Um, so the brand name for this is Tamiflu. Um, Zanamivir um, is uh, taken by inhalation. It's a, so it's a tricky drug to, to administer. And of course, if you already have a respiratory disease, you probably don't tolerate uh, an, an inhaled drug terribly well. And then paramavir is an intravenous drug. So again, probably kept more for hospitalized patients. And then lastly, in orange um, is the so-called new kid on the block. Um, so this drug, beloxavir marboxyl, targets the endonuclease function of the viral polymerase. Um, so it was quite exciting to actually have a new target um, for an antiviral drug. Um, it has been approved in three countries so far, to my knowledge, Japan, the States, and, and Australia. Um, but even in clinical, even in the clinical trial stage, they noticed that um, resistance was occurring. And so there is a concern with this drug that it is particularly prone to, to resistance. So I don't think it's been wild, widely used yet. Oseltamivir is very much still the, the drug of choice. So our problem is that, um, as, I, as I have said, all antiviral drugs that are approved are targeting viral proteins. Um, so we call these direct acting drugs. But because of this, they are very susceptible to resistance. And this is particularly true when you're targeting an RNA virus, which can um, accumulate mutations quite easily. And so the solution that, that um, we're proposing is that we should look at developing drugs that instead target host factors that the virus requires in order to replicate. And because you're targeting something in the host, this should give the um, drugs a higher barrier to resistance. This, this slide is just to illustrate that the whole the field of drug discovery um, and development is, is a very long and arduous one. Um, big pharma really tend to only get involved at the very late discovery stage or perhaps even only at the development stage. They a lot of the big pharma no longer do any you know hit discoveries. So this, this early stage drug discovery is really now left up to small biotechs and academia. And this is exactly where we um, uh, come in. Um, so over the last, heaven knows how long, 10 years plus, um, I've been involved in doing um, uh, high throughput screens um, and uh, trying to find interesting molecules um, that can potentially be moved forward in this pipeline. So I'm going to tell you about um, two hits that came from a large uh, screen that that uh, we, I ran together with um, various collaborators and colleagues. Um, and the screen has actually been very fruitful. We've had quite a lot of, of interesting compounds that have come out of it. So this screen is what we call a, a phenotypic screen. Um, basically, we weren't um, looking at the activity of a particular viral protein. We were just looking at um, the growth of the virus. So we were looking just for compounds that inhibit virus growth. So we're, we're casting a pretty wide net. It could be targeting a viral protein. It could be targeting something in the cell. And so in order to monitor virus growth easily in a, in a high throughput setting, um, as those of you who've done this know that you need a very easy readout, such as a fluorescent or luciferase marker. And so we engineered uh, luciferase into the genome of an influenza virus. And that's what's illustrated in the, in the middle here. Um, basically, what was done is that we removed the open reading frame of the hemagglutinin protein, which is the, um, the receptor binding protein. Um, and we replace that with Ranilla um, with um, 
what what's called a packaging signal on the on the ends of that segment so that it, that that it would still be recognized as an HA segment and would still be packaged into the virus. But of course, you need to then grow this virus in the presence of um, HA that's that's applied in trans. So we had an HA expressing MDCK cell line in which to grow this virus. So this um, high throughput screen assay was set up in um, multi well format in uh, 1536 well, and uh, we plated the cells, added the compounds, and then added the virus. And 30 hours later, read uh, luciferase activity as a measure of, of virus growth. And we um, screened a um, 9,000 or just an over 900,000 um, compound library that was available to us at the um, Genomics Institute of the Novartis Research Foundation, or commonly known as GNF. So this was their what, what's called their academic library. So most of these compounds were commercially available. There was nothing proprietary in there. Um, and uh, but we got to make use of all their um, equipment. I mean, they had you know uh, very, very impressive high throughput screening facilities um, with all the robotic equipment, et cetera. So our hit rate from the screen was 0.5%. We took all those um, initial hits and um, then assayed them in dose response, which of course whittled down that, that number even further. And then we had chemists look at the structure of the, of the compound hits uh, and group them um, according to their structural similarity. And at the end, um, you know, we chose um, certain compounds for, for validation. And what I'm going to show you next on the, on the next slide, are just some of the data from five compounds which we have characterized um, in detail. Um, so you can see, um, I'm going to highlight uh, these uh, three at the bottom here first, um, S57, S20, and S119, that um, some of our hits did target uh, viral proteins. And the way that we determined this, first of all, um, you, we confirmed that um, these compounds only inhibited influenza virus, and when we tested them against other viruses, there was no activity. So we um, concluded that they were specific for influenza virus. And then what we can do is we can select for resistance in tissue culture. Um, and then uh, if you get resistance, which you usually do if you're targeting a viral protein, you we would then sequence the virus and determine the protein that the virus was targeting, and of course, the exact um, uh, amino acids that were involved in that interaction. So that's how those were characterized. But the two that I'm going to focus on today are the ones that um, are targeting um, host proteins. Um, and uh, one of these we have already um, published, but the other one, um, M4, um, is very much still under under under. Um, um, investigation and we're, we're gathering uh, data um, uh, right now. So the first one, M85, um, as I said, um, initially we obviously just we determined that it inhibited uh, influenza A virus, which is which is the virus that we screened with. We then tested against influenza B virus, and it, it showed activity against influenza B virus as well. Um, and after that, we then um, started testing against non-influenza viruses. And you can see for M85 that we showed that this particular compound has activity against hepatitis C virus, um, rhinovirus, as well as a moderate activity, not very strong, but moderate activity against SARS coronavirus 2. So that immediately tells you you've got some kind of broad spectrum activity going on. It's equally important, though, that there were a number of viruses shown shown down here where M85 showed no activity, and that's important because you know, you can then be sure that you're not getting some just non-specific um, cytotoxic effect that could be um, you know um, presenting itself as as antiviral activity, but it but it's not. So that's actually good that it it the the compound um, shows activity against certain subset of viruses, but not all. 
The next thing we did was to um, try and se to select for resistance. So this is, as I said, something that we we'd done before where we were characterizing the compounds that target the viral proteins. And we did the same thing here. So basically we passaged the um, virus, in this case, influenza virus in the presence of M85. Um, and we did this nine times. And so in this table here, what I'm showing you is that um, if you passage the virus nine times in the presence of DMSO, which is of course our, our negative control, um, and then after that, those nine passages, um, you uh, determine the um, uh, potency of oseltamivir as well as M85. So uh, oseltamivir and M85 obviously both can um, inhibit the, the virus that's been passaged in the presence of DMSO. After you've passaged the virus nine times in the presence of oseltamivir, and then you retest the potency, you can see that you've lost <clears throat> potency. So in fact, now this uh, passage viruses is approximately 34-fold resistant to oseltamivir. We tried the same thing with M85, and we even after nine passages, we didn't really see any, any resistance. 1.6-fold uh, is not, not really significant. So basically, our conclusion is that um, we have firstly a, a, a broad spectrum antiviral that targets um, viruses from different families, and also that it provides a higher barrier to resistance than does a compound that targets a, targets a viral protein. So taken together, these two pieces of information indicate that M85 is most likely targeting a host factor. And <clears throat> with M85, we got a little bit lucky. So its um, chemical structure um, resembles that of a kinase inhibitor. Um, and so as soon as we got that piece of information from our, our um, chemists, we um, uh, put this put M M85 through a kinome scan, <coughs> excuse me, and um, <coughs> tested it against um, a number of, of kinases. And there were there were two um, particular families that that came up in the in the screen, um, the the her family, which includes EGFR, and the PI3 kinase um, family. So in green, you can see the particular um, kinases that um, were showing um, inhibition by by M eighty five, particularly EGFR and um, PI three kinase C two B, which is a class two um, PI three kinase. We had we also um, determined that M eighty five is acting specifically on the entry of influenza virus. So we did this through um, a, an assay, which we refer to as a time of addition assay where we add the compound um, either uh, before infection, uh, two hours before infection, at the time of infection, or at two hour intervals post-infection. And then we determine the, the virus titer <clears throat> after, after um, <clears throat> I think it was 12 or 24 hours. And so you can see here that um, <clears throat> um, only when you add the virus either before infection or at the time of infection do you see strong inhibition. If you add the, the compound even just two hours after infection, you've basically lost all um, lost all inhibition. And so this clearly indicates that that M85 must be acting at the at the early stage um, of the virus life cycle, which is the the entry stage. So now now we had important information that it was inhibiting certain kinases and that the, the virus was inhibiting at the entry stage. So what is known about influenza virus entry? So first of all, um, influenza attaches um, to sialic acid containing receptors at the cell surface. And then it, um, it enters via um, endocytosis, either clathrin um, dependent or clathrin independent, or um, macropenocytosis. So there, there are different um, pathways that have been described. Um, um, so it's, it's basically flu is a little bit promiscuous. So if you if you block one pathway, it'll get in through another pathway. But all of these pathways all um, lead into the endocytic pathway. 
And um, so once the virus is uh, taken up into the early endosome, it then gets trafficked to the late endosome. And <clears throat> once in the pH, once in the late endosome, um, the low pH will trigger um, fusion. And so you get um, uh, a fusion of the, of the viral envelope with the um, membrane of the endosome and you get release of the viral genome. And um, influenza uh, replicates in the nucleus, so the viral genome is then translocated into the nucleus. So I'm um, skipping over some negative data because we, we proved that M85 is firstly not um, inhibiting acidification of endosomes, and it's also not uh, inhibiting the fusion um, event. Rather, it seems that M85 was acting actually on um, uh, endocytosis itself uh, and preventing the um, trafficking of, inf of incoming influenza virus particles. And so we observed that the virus seemed to become trapped um, at a very um, early stage close to the cell surface. So this is the data that, that led us to, to that conclusion. So basically what we did was we infected um, cells in the presence of either DMSO or M85, and then we fixed and stained at either one hour post-infection or four hours post-infection. And we stained for NP, which is the, the viral nuclear protein. <clears throat> um, the, um, the green staining here is wheat, wheat germagglutinin, just so that you can see the outline of the cell surface. And um, nuclear protein, um, so it comes in with the virus because it coats the viral genome. Um, but uh, as soon as um, synthesis, uh, gene synthesis starts, that newly synthesized um, NP will go into the nucleus. So you can see if you look at the DMSO panels at one hour post-infection, you can see that there's um, red staining um, uh, approximately um, uh, at, at the cell membrane, um, whereas by four hours post-infection in DMSO, you're seeing very, very bright red staining in the nuclei. So that is actually new NP that's already been synthesized. And then if you look under the M85 conditions, again, at one hour post-infection, you again see um, the NP signal at the cell surface. But, but however, at, at four hours post-infection, there's obviously no um, uh, NP signal in the in the nucleus like there is for DMSO. And although it, although it's quite faint, you can uh, see that the the remaining NP signal is still sitting approximately at the cell surface. So the virus does not seem to have been able to move past that initial um, entry point. So that's what led us um, to that conclusion and allowed us to kind of build up a model of what's going on. So <clears throat> we know that influenza virus binds to its sialic acid containing receptors in these so-called lipid raft complexes or regions in the membrane that are, are rich in cholesterol. And it's also reported that when influenza virus binds, it seems to activate EGFR. So that was already known um, um, at the time that, that um, we were doing the study. And so what we believe is happening that um, influenza is binding um, in the region of, of where the EGFR receptor is and activating it, um, that is then uh, signaling down to um, the PI3 kinase, particularly the class two. <clears throat> and that um, leads to the phosphorylation of PIP in the, in the membrane, which stimulates the um, uh, formation of the early endosome and hence traffics the, the influenza virus particle um, start through the endocytic pathway. And so we believe that in the presence of M85, we're getting a block, um, first of all, in um, the um, activation of um, uh, PI3 kinase by, um, by the EGFR receptor. And we're also getting a block in um, the activation of, of PIP. Um, so we think there's a kind of um, a dual event that's happening that's um, acting essentially on the same pathway and preventing the trafficking of influenza virus into these early endosomes. So that's the um, 
the mechanistic conclusion for how M85 is acting. And um, the continued work on this um, compound is more in terms of um, chemistry, medicinal chemistry, to try and increase potency and um, increase bioavailability so that we can move this into animal models. So now I'm going to um, focus on our other um, uh, potential broad spectrum compound that we discovered in the screen, called, which is called M4. And on this slide, I'm just um, showing you that um, it indeed does have quite potent activity against influenza virus. So we just grew influenza virus in the presence of increasing amounts of M4. And you can see in the blue line that the, the viral titer drops um, quite drastically as you increase the M4 concentration. And in parallel, we also measured um, cytotoxicity. So you can see in the red um, that yes, there is some cytotoxicity at the at the higher concentrations, but importantly, you have a very wide window between um, the uh, antiviral effect and the cytotoxic effect, and that's always what's measured by this SI or selective index uh, metric. Um, and so, generally speaking, you you always want to have that window greater than ten. So in this case, a window of two thousand is is quite significant. And then um, similarly as to what we did before, we um, looked at other viruses. So first of all, we stayed within the influ influenza family, looked at influenza B virus, saw inhibition there, um, four logs of inhibition. Um, and then we also discovered that M4 can inhibit Ebola virus as well as um, uh, vaccinia virus to a, to a small extent and, and human adenovirus. But as I said before, it's also important to note that there were some viruses that M4 did not have any antiviral activity against. So again, this, this um, gives you some assurance that it's not acting through some nonspecific cytotoxic um, effect. And then we went on to try and um, assess the mechanism of M4. We weren't as, as lucky as um, with M M85, we had a very nice time of addition assay that clearly showed that M85 was uh, targeting entry. That time of addition assay didn't give us a very clear answer for M84, M4. So we, we did a specific assay for specific stages of the life cycle. So here I'm showing you first um, an entry assay, which we run using um, pseudoparticles. And um, you can see that in the presence of M4, there is no inhibition of virus entry compared to in the presence of DMSO. Whereas our positive control compound, this is um, S20, which inhibits the viral HA protein and um, targets virus entry. We could have also used M85 here. Um, so M84 does not inhibit influenza virus entry. So we then looked at the stage of virus um, replication and gene expression. And to do this, we make use of what we call in the, in the field a mini genome assay. Um, basically, this assay relies on viral polymerase activity, um, and it captures both genome replication as well as gene expression. Um, so for this, our positive control that we used was the Biloxivir Marboxyl, one of the approved drugs, which targets um, one of the polymerase co um, components. So you can see this drastically um, inhibits the signal. And we can see that there is a, an effect of M4 on this assay. Um, it's what I would call moderate. It's, it's not very potent, but there definitely is some um, specific effect happening um, on, on viral gene expression. <clears throat> and so that's, that is what led us to the, the next um, experiment where we tracked um, the nuclear protein through the stages of the influenza virus life cycle. So nuclear protein, as I think I described on the, on the earlier slide, is the viral protein that, that coats the viral genome. And when, it, um, when that, that uh, genome comes into the cell, obviously the, that um, will initiate um, transcription and um, uh, protein synthesis. And with the new NP that's made will be expressed in the nucleus. 
And then once viral gene expression and replication has taken place and uh, virus assembly is starting to happen, the NP will then translocate out of the nucleus again. So we expect to see initially nuclear signal and then later a cytoplasmic signal. And you can see that happening um, when the cells are treated with DMSO, <clears throat> that um, initially at two hours, you're, you're not seeing much signal because the only thing that's in that cell that at that point is the incoming virus. Um, and you need a, a lot of virus there to be, to be able to detect the actual NP. Um, so you don't see much at two hours, but by four hours, you can see the new nuclear protein um, being expressed and it's in the nucleus. By six hours, you can see that some of it is coming out again. And, um, and by eight hours, which is generally towards the end of the virus life cycle, you can see that most of the NP um, is now strongly um, in the cytoplasm. And I'm sure you've already noticed that that's not the same for M4. So M4, um, you only see nuclear NP. Even at the six hour and the eight hour time point, there is no evidence of any cytoplasmic NP. So it appears that in the presence of M4, um, there's a block in the export of the, um, the NP, um, which is probably indicative of the entire viral um, nuclear protein complex. So the viral genome that's, that's coated with the, the NP and also associated with the polymerase protein. We we carried we carried on this time course just to just to see whether if we left it long enough we would start to see the NP coming out of the nucleus and even um, you know up to twelve hours which is past the the um, time point for the the end of the virus life cycle there was still no evidence of cytoplasmic um, NP so we think that there was quite a strong block um, in the in the nuclear export. We also looked at one of the other viral components of the, the RMP. So the actual polymerase component is, is, a, is a associated with the, the RMP. And PB1 is um, one of the polymerase um, subunits, the one that actually um, encodes the polymerase activity. And you can see that likewise, and, uh, if you look in DMSO-treated cells um, at later time points, you can see that the PB1 is expressed in the cytoplasm. Whereas in the M4 treated cells, it all seems to be retained um, in the nucleus. So we believe that M4 is basically retaining the viral nuclear pro the viral RMP complex in the nucleus and therefore halting uh, the virus life cycle um, at that point. So one of the key questions, of course, is what host protein is M4 targeting? And um, unfortunately, uh, it, we didn't have as easy a time of this as with M85. We didn't have a clue from the structure of the compound. So what we've done um, is to um, take a chemoproteomics approach. So we have um, modified the M4 structure um, by adding an alkyne tag and obviously made sure that we retain antiviral activity. And then we've used this modified M4 as a probe. So treated um, cells with um, this um, M4 probe and prepared uh, the lysate from that and then performed click labeling to add um, biotin um, to, to the M4 <clears throat> um, via, via the tag and then precipitated M4 and all associated proteins um, with streptavidin uh, beads, and then identified those proteins using mass spec. This was um, performed for us um, by Mike Bolong um, at Scripps. So we've um, so far um, been able to identify, of, of course, with any mass spec experiment, you don't just get one answer, you get a whole list of proteins. So in red are, are all the, the, the um, top hits from, from this chemoproteomics uh, approach. And we are in the process now of, of um, characterizing these hits and uh, trying to determine whether um, uh, knockdown um, of any of these hits recapitulates the activity of, of M4. Um, you know, do, do we also see that uh, we're getting a block in RMP export in the absence of that protein? Um, is, are these proteins critical uh, to supporting uh, virus replication? So that's the, that's the point at which we are with, with our M4 story. 
So I just have a, a few take home points um, from these two um, studies. <clears throat> so firstly, when you're performing antiviral screens using a cell-based assay, it um, allows you um, to identify compounds that are targeting host factors that are, are critical for virus replication. And while, while obviously um, the, these can potentially be developed into antiviral drugs, as I'm proposing here, on, on the flip side, um, they also provide very useful information um, on novel virus host interactions. Um, you know, we, all RNA viruses, all viruses, but particularly small RNA viruses, um, rely very much on, on host functions. Uh, and we've probably only characterized a, a small percentage of those to date. And so um, any, any new knowledge um, in this area uh, will be, would be extremely beneficial. Um, I think we've we've proven that um, host-directed antivirals can give you broad-spectrum activity across unrelated virus families, and also that they can potentially provide a higher barrier to resistance. And so that would make them very useful um, to um, to be stockpiled and also to uh, for use against viruses for which we don't have any uh, virus-specific um, antivirals. Um, the antiviral world tends to be very um, bottlenecked uh, in terms of certain virus families. For instance, we have lots of drugs against HIV um, uh, and, and other virus families, we have uh, no approved drugs. And of course, um, I think these days we, sh we need to think more about using drugs in combination. Um, <clears throat> uh, we know that if you use a, a drug as a monotherapy um, and that drug targets a viral, viral protein, you're almost sure to get resistance. And this is the reason why all HIV therapy and hepatitis C therapy are all given as combinations nowadays. Um, so I think by combining a host-directed drug with a virus-specific um, drug, um, you could... Um, uh, create a, a a much higher barrier to resistance and and pre prevent the emergence of any uh, drug resistant viruses. So at this time, I just want to acknowledge um, the people that were involved in um, these projects. Um, so this project started as I say many years ago when I was still at uh, Mount Sinai in New York. Um, and M85 in particular was was characterized by my um, PhD student at the time, who, who's, who's since graduated, Ryan. And um, the person who actually started, who was around when we were first um, identifying the hits from the screen, was a postdoc, Chris White, who actually now has his own independent lab at Mount Sinai. And then my close collaborators there, Adolfo Garcia Sastra, um, and Sumit Chanda, who is now at Scripps, um, and uh, we're actually continuing on this collaboration together with uh, Noika, who's who's also at Scripps. And then the M4 project is much more recent work that's um, uh, been done as part of um, uh, Jihan's um, uh, PhD thesis. Um, but the early work was again um, started by by Chris White, and we're being um, assisted. Um, uh, through um, a, a large grant, um, which I'll acknowledge in a minute, um, which is also funding um, work that's been done at Scripps um, by Sumit Chanda's lab, and I mentioned Mike Bolong as well. So we're, we're lucky enough to get some funding for, for this um, project from the, the US Department of Defense, um, and the initial um, funding that, that actually um, uh, started the whole screening exercise was um, NIH funding. So I'm very grateful for them for getting us started and allowing us to make these, these interesting discoveries. And I'm happy to take any questions. <clears throat>